All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Community Conversations. I'm uh, pleased to be wrapping up a great quarter of presentations on communication. And uh, we're going to be finishing this off with Adam Wolfer today talking about science communication. Before I introduce our speaker, though, I do want to remind people that we are going to be on hiatus over the uh, finals week and spring break at LCC, but we will be back with our spring series. Our spring theme is going to be race in America and beyond. And we will be starting presentations on April 15th. So keep an eye on the website. We'll have more details as we get those hammered out. Uh, but from the, uh, from the behind the scenes, I'm gonna tell you it's gonna be a great series. We've got a lot of different people coming in and, uh, and sharing their expertise with us. Also remember that we do record all of these events and we post them up on the LCC uh, lowercolumbia.edu slash conversations website. So you can see this quarter's presentations as well as the archive uh, will show a lot of presentations from the past few years. So if you miss the, the ones that we did in HSB 101, you can go back and find some of those and share them with your friends and neighbors and family and things like that. So today I wanna to welcome Adam Wolfer. Dr. Adam Wolfer is in his 21st year as a chemistry instructor here at LCC. He received his doctorate in science education, master's in chemistry and bachelor's in science education from Oregon State University, which according to him demonstrates his lack of imagination. I say it shows his loyalty. Adam has been interested in science as long as he can remember. He may have started as a child by doing chemistry experiments in his bathroom sink, but you cannot rely on stories told by his mother as she is known to bend the truth. He is very happy that his parents never talked him out of always asking why. Please welcome Adam Wolfer. Hello, um, thanks for coming. This is going to be a little different. I haven't actually taught any lectures on Zoom before, so we'll see how this goes. Because um, technology, it, just to make sure, is applied science, so I'm not necessarily a huge technical person. Okay, so as you, you, if you've read the cartoon on the page, you can know where I got the title, That is Science, because um, as the young student says, I produced a detailed tribute to my wrongness. And the teacher says, that is science. Okay, so I've been interested in science as long as I can remember. That was always my favorite subject in school. Um, and I remember doing presentations in school on famous scientists. I remember doing one on Albert Einstein and explaining um, the theory of relativity, which the teacher didn't know that my understanding of the theory of relativity in fifth grade was based on a cartoon I had seen on Saturday morning, which is probably for the best. Hopefully she's not watching and go back and fail me and fifth grade science but okay so what why science why is science important well one thing that I, I always joke about this with my students when we're talking about how to name chemicals but um, in 2013 some DJs played an April Fool prank this was in um, Fort Myers Florida and they basically said that that dihydrogen monoxide was coming out of all the taps in the town of Fort Myers, Florida. This led to a panic because people were calling the city government, uh, the police, everybody saying, we've heard that dihydrogen monoxide is coming out of our taps and we wanna know, is it safe to drink? Well, dihydrogen monoxide is the chemical name for water, which hopefully many of you know, but you might not know if you've never taken a chemistry course. So that created a panic. The DJs actually were suspended. The article I read didn't say if they were reinstated or lost their job or anything, but it created kind of a panic in that area. So what was a joke kind of was a problem in the communication of science because a lot of people didn't know what that dihydrogen monoxide is just water. So I'm gonna give you a pop quiz because it's important to know what is science. So you need to take out a piece of paper. Actually, you don't really, but since I haven't been teaching lectures live for over a year, I need to be able to do this because 
and he it feeds into my evil side to make my students take a quiz at the last minute. So for each one of these pictures I'm going to show you, you need to answer. Is it science? Yes or no? And this last one, I have to point out something really important. This is um, one of my former students is one of the co-authors of this article and she's very proud. It's her first professional article. It's the surface chemistry and quantum dot luminescence, shell growth, atomistic modification and beyond. That's all I understand of the article. I will have to read it again. Don't tell Melanie that, um, that I didn't quite understand it, but that's what happens to educators. You get students who go on and study areas that you don't know. So let's go back quickly over um, these. So this is the periodic table. It is a representation, is one way we communicate science. So this is all the elements um, that have been discovered, all, all 118 of them. Those of you that's been a while since you've taken chemistry might not recognize some of the last few. Um, they're mostly ones that are gray, though mitnarium has been known for at least the last 10, 15, maybe 20 years or more. This is a diagram for um, astrology. Uh, it's not really science. And this is the Schrodinger wave equation, uh, which I can recognize I don't know how to use it because I didn't take that area of chemistry in graduate school, but um, it's an interesting one. And then Melanie's article. So let's, oh, and I forgot there's one more. And this is a representation of DNA. So what is science? try to figure out what the answer to this is. And it's actually one of the first assignments I give my students is to define science because they're studying science and why and figure out why they have to study science. What is, what is science? So I start finding definitions around and I don't share these with my students. Typically they have to find, they have to determine themselves. So Alan Sokol is a physicist. Um, he's well known for um, something called the Sokol hoax. So you may look that up later if you're interested, but he's an intellectual endeavor aimed at a rational understanding of the natural and social world. Bertrand Russell is a philosopher, um, also a Nobel Prize winning, um, he won the Nobel Prize in literature many years ago. And he's also a mathematician, philosopher, so he says, science is the attempt to discover by means of observation and reasoning based upon it, first particular facts about the world and then laws connecting facts with one another and in fortunate cases, making it possible to predict future occurrences. My students, former students and current students, that last part is something I emphasize that science is making it possible to predict future occurrences. Richard Feynman is a Nobel Prize winning physicist. He worked on the Manhattan Project. So he says, um, and that is what science is, the result of the discovery that it is worthwhile rechecking by new direct experience and not necessarily trusting the race experience from the past. That not trusting the race experience from the past is an important part of what science is because we're always testing our understanding of science and natural world through science. So I ran across this, which is a really nice synopsis of what science is. This is from the legal case, McLean versus Arkansas Board of Education. Uh, basically the um, Arkansas Board of Education said that passed a law saying that all public schools in Arkansas had to give equal time to creation science. And they were sued by the ACLU. And this was part of the judge's decision by Judge William Overton. Um, so it's guided by natural law. 
it has to be explanatory by reference to natural law, is testable against the empirical world, its conclusions are tentative, i.e. are not necessarily the final world, word, excuse me, and is falsifiable. So we can prove science is wrong. That's part of what science is. So anything that you cannot disprove can't really be science because that is not part of how we, how we work in science. And Bertrand Russell had uh, in his um, book, Religion and Science, had a lot of interesting things to say about science. Um, so I'll let you read this one yourself and then go on. And I have to point out this cartoon. This is one my wife sent to me. My wife is a mathematician and I think she likes physics better than chemistry because there's more math to it. But so one of the ways that philosophers of science and scientists and science educators study science is by looking at what's called the nature of science. And so um, these three authors who Norm Letterman was my major professor at Oregon State and Phil Wade and Randy Bell were colleagues of mine of other grad students. So in the nature of science, they test different aspects of students' understanding of science. So these six ideas are part of what science is and when they test for understanding of the nature of science. So it's developmental. So science builds on itself. It's testable. This is also sometimes um, based on a philosopher of science named Karl Popper is referred to as, falsifi as falsifiable. So we can test our understanding of science. It's unified so that all science is tied together in some way, though we sometimes argue over which is the best science because chemistry obviously is the best science. Um, it's parsimonious, meaning that it's stingy or frugal. We don't, Scientists tend not to like, you know, explanations that take 15 pages to describe. Prefer something that can be described in a, an equation that takes, you know, like one line. And it's amoral, which I know some people freak out when they see this amoral. That's not, does not mean the same as immoral. Amoral means that it's not good or bad. It's knowledge. How that knowledge is used can be immoral or moral, but science is amoral. And it's creative, which I've had a lot of students who said, science can't be creative. And some other people, when they find out what I do, they said, oh, well, you lose, there's no creativity. If you look at how scientists have solved the problems in the world, you know it's creative because you have to be creative to come up with a way to solve these problems. And so one of the issues in science is the fact that we use everyday English words in different ways in science. And one of those that drives me a little crazy sometimes my students is the term theory. Theory is extremely important idea in science. A theory is overarching, it covers a vast area of science. So like atomic theory or the theory of evolution or quantum theory, those cover huge amounts of information, not just a, a um, educated guess, which is more a hypothesis. So Raoul Hoffman is a Nobel Prize winning chemist who writes essays for um, a journal, which I'm now blanked on what journal that is, but um, he published an article called Why Buy That Theory that tries to explain how we evaluate scientific theories and why they're important. So he came out with, these are his um, ideas on how we evaluate scientific theories. So we talk about scientific theory is it simplicity. A complicated theory doesn't necessarily 
answer the question very well. We always are trying to simplify them. And some scientific theories are highly regarded because they tell a story. They explain from beginning to end uh, what's happening with the content. We also have, he used the phrase, a roll-on suitcase, because a good theory in science is portable. If it explains something in biology, it could also explain something in chemistry or physics. And that's, it has pro productivity, so it's productive. It leads us to find more answers. So the best way to evaluate a scientific theory, and this is, um, kind of how I view what theories are. It's a framework for understanding. It's an overarching explanation of why what we observe is happening. So why, when we mix two chemicals, do they react the way they do? Well, we can go back to atomic theory that all matter is made of atoms to help as a framework for understanding why they react that way. And then that gives us an area to work in. And the last is that he called it tis a gift, that it brings clarity and predictability. So just to make sure I continue to torture my, any of my students that are watching, one of my um, things I tell them is you study science so that you understand the humor in science. So this is um, one of my favorite TV shows. Adam, we're not getting sound on this, just so you know. Okay, I heard Courtney say something, so I may have messed up. Did that work? We could see it with the captions, but there was no sound. Hmm. I told you I'm not a technician. Sorry about that. But that's one of the most famous physics jokes is about spherical chickens or spherical cows. Um, and it also points out that physicists don't really have a sense of humor. Um, don't tell any physicists, you know, I said that. So you all know some of the ideas about what scientists are like. Well, one of the things that's happening now, it's been happening for, you know, 15, 20 years or more, but I've become more aware of it now, is the training of scientists to be better communicators. Because unfortunately, a lot of scientists are more comfortable communicating with other scientists. We use the same language. We can talk in the same languages like math. Um, so one person that's really big in this is the actor, Alan Alda, who has loved science since he was a kid. If you watch any interviews with him, he'll talk about it. He's um, He hosted Scientific American Frontiers for many years, which was a great show. Um, he also has written a play about um, Marie Curie and starred in a, a one-man play where he played Richard Feynman, who was a Nobel Prize winning physicist. But they now have the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science at Stony Brook University which when I lived in New York, we always called it SUNY Stony Brook. So I don't know which is actually the correct one. But um, in that, that center, they're working to communicate science, mostly graduate students, but some practicing scientists on how to communicate their information to a non-science audience. One of the really cool things that he's brought into the 
into this center is using theater and some of the training in theater. For example, different acting exercises where actors learn to communicate with each other, to observe each other, to read what the other person is, not only what they're saying, but what they're experiencing, what they're thinking emotionally, so that there's a greater emotional connection. So part of the training is actually to go through theatrical training, um, like improv or other acting exercises to learn about each other and to learn <clears throat> how to read your audience so that when your audience gets lost, <clears throat> um, you know that they're lost and you try and get them back on, which is why it's really difficult. I don't get to see any of you, but also there's some great books out there. This one's one I read a few years ago. Um, I guess not too many years ago since it's only been out for three years, but don't be such a scientist. Um, Randy Olson is a, <clears throat> was an oceanographer who fell in love with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, who fell in love with filmmaking and is now a filmmaker as well. So he wrote this book. He does a lot of training of scientists on how to communicate with non-scientists. So there are a lot of issues in communicating science and the most important one is that scientists are human and non-scientists are human. So I actually thought at one point, I could just stop here. We all understand that um, being human, we make mistakes in communication all the time. So the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine publish research reports Many, time, many different research reports a year. And I'm actually, I get an email from them like once every two weeks of the newest report they have out. Um, some of them are interesting. Many of them are in a very technical areas. I have no interest whatsoever, but this one sounded interesting. Communicating science effectively. So that's kind of a big part of my presentation today. So, in the introduction in this research report, which is done by a bunch of people who their focus is communicating in science or science communication. So it's the methods scientists use to understand the world are unlike the ways people typically think on a day-to-day -day basis. The results of science also can be insignificant or insufficient, ambiguous or uncertain, and scientific conclusions can change over time as new findings emerge. These inherent characteristics of science can create barriers to communication and understanding. So science communication and science itself can be insufficient, ambiguous, or uncertain, and scientific conclusions can change over time as new findings emerge. This is one of the things that annoys non-scientists a lot. It's also one of the things that keeps scientists in the game because they're like, yeah, it's changing because we're learning more. Scientists are the people who want to answer to the question why. And for all, any teachers or faculty out there, um, <clears throat> those students sometimes are extremely annoying because they always want to know why. And you're like, uh, yeah, we're not, we're not going to get to the why yet. That's a little bit later. But <clears throat> also then the issue of science being uncertain, you hear a lot of people say, well, you know, scientists, they change their mind. They tell you, you know, one year that eating eggs is bad for you. And then two years later, they say it's good for you. That's because we gather more information and sometimes it changes our conclusions. <clears throat> so I think if, since I don't know why the sound was muted, I'm gonna skip this, but if you're interested, this is a great scene between two actors playing Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. Niels Bohr is, a uh, Danish physicist, Nobel Prize winner, Albert Einstein, German scientist, Nobel Prize winner. And they strongly disagreed about one of the most important <clears throat> pieces of science that came out in the early 1900s, which is quantum theory. 
And so here they are discussing it between them. Um, so I'll let you find that on your own, hopefully. But what the National Academies Press, the authors who put together that um, book I showed you a minute ago, they said that science communication is defined as the exchange of information and viewpoints about science to achieve a goal or objectives such as fostering greater understanding of science and scientific methods or gaining greater insight into diverse public views and concerns about the science related to a contentious issue. So those contentious issues are the ones that are part of what I'm gonna focus on near the end of the presentation because those are the ones that are often get the most press. They're, they're what's in the newspaper a lot. You can think of some global warming, vaccinations, um, COVID, et cetera, are all those contentious issues. So the things that affect science communication, psychological, being human beings, we all have our own psychological um, way of looking at the world, political, you, heard lots of political arguments about science back and forth over the, the years. Societal, because there are, it's not just science that affects decisions that are being made. So societal norms, et cetera, also play a part. Cultural, um, there's a really interesting book that I haven't got a chance to read. It's sitting on my shelf called braiding sweetgrass by a Native American uh, biologist who writes how her cultural heritage affects how she looks at science. Economic, because money is always going to be an issue, money and jobs. Moral, is um, what they're thinking of doing, does that fit the moral aspects of what we think is should be done? And uh, media related. So what, because often the media, they're trying to find something that's gonna draw in viewers. So it isn't all necessarily, they may be manufacturing some issues, which if you've been uh, going to more, all of the community conversations this quarter, several of them have talked about that same issue and then institutional, because different institutions look at things differently and they put a focus maybe on one aspect of the science or other, or the economics or cultural, societal, et cetera. So they shared the goals of science communication. One is to share excitement of science. Hopefully that's what I do in my classes. Um, if I don't, and you're one of my students, don't tell me, please. Um, to increase appreciation for science as a worldview, because it's one of the many ways we look at our world is through a lens of science. And so the more you know about science, the more wonder there can be, more appreciation. Um, and then understanding the science-related content for a specific issue for example, the environment, global warming, a lot of these are GMOs are all things that um, understand the science is important. And also then communicating science, we also wanna influence people's opinions, their behavior, and also policy preferences. And also, as with any communication, you wanna include the diverse groups and perspectives about science, make sure that those are part of what is being um, considered in decision-making, especially on the contentious issues, that we get feedback from lots of different groups so we understand what the effects of decisions might be. So when scientists engage with the public about science content, that should always be a two-way communication. 
the scientists need to be willing to listen and not say, well, I'm the scientist, therefore you have to do it my way. That leads to bigger problems, which some of which we'll talk about a little bit later. And the controversial issues are not always bad because often when dealing with controversial issues, it helps scientists and non-scientists to make decisions in a better way by seeing the controversy and then maybe viewing it from a diff through a different lens. And the decisions that are made if, through public, through political decisions or you know, lo even local decision are not made solely on scientific evidence. There are also the impacts, the moral um, and economic, et cetera, impacts as well. So that public engagement between scientists and non-scientists also builds and sustains trust amongst the stakeholders. Um, many of you have probably heard of alchemy. One of the biggest issues with alchemy was that the alchemists didn't want to share what they were learning with everyone else. So they shared their information in very different ways so that the general public could not understand what they were talking about. They didn't try to share that information with the general public. And the public engagement around science always does have an ethical component. Said that science is amoral, but the applications of science is not. We need to have an ethical component. This is, is this a good idea or not? So I have to admit that many times in my life, I've subscribed to what's called the deficit model of science communication. The deficit model basically says that non-scientists just need to hear the science of an important question that is settled and immutable. The task is to explain the facts to the non-scientists. If we just share the facts that we know more, spread it out more, communicate better with, with people, then there won't be any issues. People will understand the science and everyone will, will agree. Unfortunately, this is a, a false idea. And in the book I was talking about, they um, spend quite a bit of time talking about why the deficit model of science communication is false because often the science isn't completely settled and the science is complex enough that you, you're viewing it from many different angles trying to come up with the answer. And the communication is not is not often direct from the scientist to the audience. It's often mediated through other means like newspapers. I spoke to a friend of mine who was a journalist about something I'd heard in that the fact that um, the headlines in articles often don't seem to reflect what's actually in the article. And she said that happens a lot because the articles are sent out and the newspapers often will change the headline to either for space reasons or for they just want to draw a bigger audience. So they want to make it fancier or politicize it more. And so you read the headline, then read the article and they don't necessarily match. In the nowadays with um, Facebook and others, I have uh, friends and family posting articles that they say support their argument. But if the headline does, the article itself disputes their argument, which obviously they didn't read the article. So scientific knowledge alone doesn't, isn't sufficient for achieving communication goals. And it also assumes that if you're communicating to one group, if you're sharing the scientific knowledge to one group, that that's sufficient for all the other groups. And that's not always the case. There are many other confounding factors that will change how people view the content and how they what they think about it. 
Okay, so communicating science to the public, there's many opportunities. It facilitates transparency. So when you share your science with the community, you're sharing what is known and the transparency of what's being done in science. The stakeholders then can have informed consent over decisions they're making. That's often the case with um, like here in the Pacific Northwest where we vote on specific ideas of maybe um, different laws, et cetera, that you wanna have informed consent. The stakeholders actually know the science if it's a science related issue and allows those stakeholders to learn and teach each other. But some of the issues that come up, if it's a morally charged issue, the outcome may mean more than fairness of the process. So if you go through a fair process, you still may have lots of people upset about the results and about the, the science itself. Unfortunately, there are low levels of knowledge of and about science. So that um, create, is an issue in communicating science to the public. Group dynamics are often an issue. We've all seen um, portrayed different discussions where the person who actually knows what's happened, the monster movies of the 50s and 60s were great ones for this, where someone stands up and tells them all the science they need to know and they get shouted down by a group. And there's also um, often an issue with low levels of participation. So I mentioned before that science is uncertain. There is definitely uncertainty in science and it's one of the issues about science in general that non-scientists have issues. Basically, a lot of people dislike uncertainty. They want to know what is the answer. I don't care what could be the answer, but what is the answer? In science, that's difficult to do in a lot of cases. And because of that lack of of the dislike of uncertainty, many scientists um, can avoid uncertainty in their communication, which is not a great idea. They say, well, this is what has been, this is the science and this is how it is and this is the way it's going to be. That doesn't create a lot of trust in science because often that will change. And decision makers sometimes will get lost in the science itself and choose the least vague of the alternatives of the uncertainty. And also a lot of people will say, well, scientists just don't know what they're doing. They, make up, they can't make up their mind and they attribute that uncertainty then to poor science, which isn't, it's usually, it's often great science because we found a broader answer to the questions we have like Albert Einstein's theory of relativity answered some questions they couldn't answer before. He didn't, and so that created, that actually cleared up some uncertainty, but created uh, some greater uncertainty. And the whole idea of this um, uncertainty can diminish the perceived scientific authority. So when a scientist says, well, this is what I believe, they say, oh, well, you don't know. Actually, they probably have a good idea, but, believe is a better scientific term than no. And much science is unsettled. And one of the things they brought up in the book was also the fact that a lot of people have problems with the meaning of probability terms. When they say there's a 25% chance of this, people may not understand what that really means. But making sure that we are clear about the uncertainty has some strengths as well. It promotes trust 
through transparency. So it's like, oh, the scientists are exploring this further. So I can trust them that they're actually understand what's going to happen or what's going on, excuse me. Um, and when the decision makers need to weigh risks, there it's good for them to know the uncertainty in there. Okay. Um, so basically this last part of this, in such cases, the level of scientific agreement can be misunderstood or misrepresented in public discourses. What we've been talking, or what I've been talking about. So scientific uncertainty is an important part of what science is. We don't know 100% what the answer is because we can always gather more information. And like I said, that creates some issues with people, but that's an important part of what science is. So some of the issues of um, some of the individual and our organizational factors, things like prior knowledge of science. Again, that deficit model we talked about, which is basically a false model, but also the backgrounds, values, and beliefs and cues from media have more effect on people's acceptance of science then does the knowledge of science itself in and they found this repeatedly in the people who study this area and then as many people have explained and this is something my wife is a math instructor and so this bothers her a lot but the ability to understand numeric information, to look at graphs and charts and equations and numbers and statistics and understand that isn't something that gets in the way of understanding science. So non-scientists, well, and scientists have many ways of interpreting new information, for like mental models, like analogies and metaphors, mental shortcuts, because things like heuristics, which are um, kind of frameworks that we put things in, our emotions and our motivated, motivated reasoning, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, are things that also help us to interpret new information. How do we place it in our knowledge of the world? And one of the things that um, is cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is basically the discomfort felt from holding two conflicting thoughts or a thought different than beliefs. So when you're told something that's different than what you understood from before or what you believe, it creates what psychologists call cognitive dissonance. It's also used in education because that's how people learn is they have this cognitive dissonance and it's not a comfortable position for people. They want to get rid of that cognitive dissonance. So they need to then settle that discrepancy. So the last part of my presentation, I'm gonna talk about some of the things, this is what's really important to me as a science instructor is what are the barriers to the acceptance of science? And in my preparation for this, this is a lot of what I read there's different way, barriers to acceptance of science. Things like in the media, they have what's called false balance reporting. That's where they give both sides of an issue the same amount of airtime and allow people to argue both sides when it may not actually be balanced. There, there's a greater um, understanding the evidence points to one side or the other, but they feel they need to um, balance it. And people try to protect their economic interests or ideological preferences. And I included references to all these in case one of these areas um, interests you, you can go back and find the references I read. 
uh, then also what are called echo chambers. And you see this a lot with the internet and Facebook and other um, Instagram, things like that, where basically the only information you're getting is from people who believe the same way you do. So it's called an echo chamber because all you're hearing are echoes of your own ideas, your own thoughts, your own beliefs. You're not being challenged to look at another side or what other people believe or think. So in um, risk analysis, which is, I, it's kind of a weird area of research, but um, Chris Mooney, who writes is a science writer, um, included some research in motivated reasoning in one of the books I've read. So he talks about what motivated reasoning is. It's basically that it uses emotionally biased reasoning to produce justifications or make decisions that are most desired rather than those that accurately reflect the evidence while still reducing cognitive dissonance. So basically, if someone shares some scientific research with you that doesn't match with what your beliefs are, you either discount the, that, the scientific research, discount the authority of the person who's sharing the research, or you do something else to reduce your cognitive dissonance so that you um, still feel good about who you are and what you believe, and basically ignoring the new evidence. And one of those ways that people also do that is called denial of expertise. So someone who is sharing information that's different than what you believe, you deny that they have the expertise that they possibly are, they actually do have. Another area is things that are take on a scientific mantle. They look like science, but they're not actually science. So astrology is one of those. It sounds like it is good. It talks about the stars and you know all those things, but it's a pseudoscience. It only it looks like a science, but it isn't a science. It one of the biggest factors that people see is it fails in the area of testable or being fal falsifiable. And then also the trust and credibility of the people that are speaking the science. Some people will talk scientifically and they don't actually know what they're doing. And some that are should be very credible for some reason are not are not value, uh, listed as being um, credible in what they're saying. Then also a barrier to acceptance of science is the scientific knowledge itself. I remember my mother-in-law who I love dearly. She knows a lot about biology. She studied it. She's been involved in uh, biology for most of her life. And her hearing that um, when my wife was taking high school biology, that there was a different kingdom of, of living things than what she had been taught, getting very upset about that. So she still talks about it to this day. And it's um, partly her lack of scientific knowledge in, in finding that scientists had come up with another kingdom of living things and partly not wanting to change what she thought it should be. So I talked about uh, motivated reasoning in one of the areas that it comes into is what's called cultural cognition. And so basically what cultural cognition is, is that there is four competing areas of of how we look at information. It's how we selectively credit or dismiss information in manner with our beliefs. So we can look, uh, egalitarianism in hierarchy are 
similar, or excuse me, they're on opposite ends of the spectrum and then communitarianism and individualism. So individualism is basically responsible for, if we're responsible for our own fates and communitarianism is the opposite of that. Hierarchy is, um, it's, we're more interested in structures, structure and order and egalitarianism is opposite of that. Um, and so what um, Mooney said is that when we say we're, reason, we're being reasonable or we're using reason, we may in fact be rationalizing based on our own beliefs in how we make decisions and how we take in more information. So I have to point out this um, cartoon. This was sent to me by a former student who's actually watching now. He texted me saying he's watching. Um, this is one that if you haven't studied chemistry or physics, you probably won't know why it's funny. But um, basically, Congressman Johnson comes out against poly exclusion, which is the poly exclusion principle is very important in quantum chemistry, quantum science, uh, but doesn't have a lot to do with what the politician is saying. So we also have expertise versus elitism um, that people say that they're not really experts, they're just creating elitism. They're being elite Scientists are being elite and keeping the rest of us down. Psychology plays a big part as seen all through the presentation. And then politics also plays a huge part. Um, so here are some books out there on the relationship between science and politics. See two on the left by Chris Mooney, who's um, a science writer, and then um, Dave Levitin, the third one, it's has a, a every chapter is a different fallacy or way that um, politicians misrepresent science. And to read the other two, um, Levitin's book is a good is a very interesting book, but it looks like I'm running out of time. So I just want to thank some people who helped in the presentation this. Um, my wife who looked it over and gave me feedback. Then Alex and Stephanie from the Communication Studies gave me some information. And Leslie Slape, who's a journalist who helped me understand how the media works. And then also, a lot of the cartoons I used came from foreign and current, former and current students. I give them extra credit for sending me those. So just in case you're interested, I did include um, references, which unfortunately goes on for several pages, but they're there and I'll have, um, have them posted as well so you can go back through. But. Okay, that's all I have. I guess I have a few minutes for questions. Okay, um, I one thing that I, that popped out to me instantly was you were talking about how um, scientific studies may carry a headline that is a little bit misleading, if not factually incorrect about what they're doing. I see that in history as well. There was one a few years ago that said 50% uh, of Viking warriors were female. And then you read the article and it says, okay, on one ship we found in one <laughs> instance, it's like, oh, okay. Well, you know, there's a little bit there, but it's certainly not what the headline is saying. Uh, we have a question from Sean. Uh, Sean asks, can science fiction to science fact be part of the creativity in those six ideas of understanding science? It is, it's a big issue because um, some, science fiction writers are actually scientists, like the most famous Isaac Asimov. Um, there, and often science fiction leads to people saying, well, why couldn't we do that? 
Um, there's uh, a great book called The Physics of Star Trek, and I'm trying by Lawrence Krauss. Looking at my bookshelf to see if I can get the author's name, where he talks about the difference between the science fiction and then also what science facts have come out because of that, or the application. Sometimes they apply science facts to the science fiction. So that creativity is there. It also, like I said, it leads to creativity in that someone writes this, I writes thing like a teleporter in, in Star Trek, and that may lead to people thinking, well, could that work? And leading to creative ideas and trying to find out yes or no. That's great because yeah, I've, I've done the same thing looking back at, at Star Trek and uh, some other early 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 science fiction and, and seeing the things that are I mean it's, it's my transporter or not my transporter it's my communicator and it's got yeah. everything I could possibly want I've got a computer who talks to me and everything um, thank you so much oh we have another question coming in good 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 uh, if if a science denier attempts to engage you in conversation, what is your tactic to either diffuse or engage? Ooh, that's a good question, anonymous. I personally, I try not to argue too much. Um, I try to give the f science facts as much as I can, because many many people will that creates that cognitive dissonance and will actually, they try to then think through. Um, because, you know, I've had people and I have friends on Facebook who are very pro-science, but they're not good at communicating science because they tell people that don't understand the science that they're idiots. That doesn't help. So I try and discuss the science and help them to kind of gradually work through the science of uh, this is what scientists think and then talk to them and say, well, and also some things like evolution is a big issue uh, because if people believe the Bible is the word of God and it says that evolution doesn't, didn't happen, that it didn't happen that way, it's hard to argue that because my argument then is, well, from a scientific standpoint, we look at what does the evidence show us? And unfortunately, and this is where I sometimes get in trouble, is that the Bible is not scientific evidence. It's a beautiful piece of literature. It's a statement of faith, whatever you want to call it, but it's not a scientific document. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, and that seems to be, um something that's come up again and again in this series is how do you refute incorrect information? How do you um, sort of challenge people who are passing along bad information, things like that. And, and that, that there's all sorts of psychology behind that. There's all sorts of, of strategy behind that. Um, but a lot of it comes from sort of reaching out and being, um, you know, personally connected to the people that you're interacting with. So it, it's, going after internet trolls is not effective, but talking to your parents can be because you can reach out to them in a, in a kind and loving way and try to communicate with them, you know, on, in good faith, so to speak. Yeah. The, um, one of the books by Chris Mooney called the Republican brain. I'm going through it now about halfway through, but he basically talks about the psychology of, a belief in understanding of science and other things. It's a great book. And he, though the title may turn some people off, ignore the title and read the book if you're interested in that area. Well, thank you very much. Um, Adam, I'm gonna ask you for your slides so we can post these on the website as well so people can go and look at your reading list and things like that. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Adam, for sharing your knowledge and uh, giving us a lot of great um, uh, cartoons that I love. <laughs> I always like seeing all those. Um, and please come and join us again in April when we're back for our spring series. Thank you, everybody.